Shalom and welcome to all our viewers and to my very good friend, Yonathan, Jonathan Pollard. Shalom. Shalom, Rav. Today is Monday, Yom Sheni. Uh, hey, the Tishrei, the fifth of the month of Tishrei, Tau Shin Pehe. And uh, that corresponds to the 7th of October, a date that will live in infamy. Uh, 2024, this is exactly one year now from the day of that barbaric and uh, terrible attack against the Jewish people. Uh, according to the Gregorian calendar, according to our calendar, the the uh, anniversary will be uh, in uh, two and a half weeks' time or so. Having said that, just before we we went live now, Jonathan, uh, we we heard here uh, south of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem, we heard certain uh, distant sounds of explosions, which I checked just a short while ago on the internet, and uh, a ground-to-ground -ground missile sent, uh, fired at, at us from Yemen, from Teman, was intercepted by the Israeli Air Force. Your comments? From what I understand, there was debris from this around uh, Bet Shemesh, uh, which is north of both of us in Yerushalayim, um, but because of the geography of this area, uh, we hear echoes from lots of places further north of us. We've had two strikes by the Israeli Air Force against Yemen, both of which, I might add, should have been combined in one strike. But the fact that they weren't shows that the doctrine of incrementalism continues to be alive and well in the minds of the general staff here in Israel. The Americans finally conducted a rather, well, robust uh, ground strike from uh, cruise missiles, uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles fired by uh, naval ships, U.S. naval ships, and um, hasn't seemed to have done much uh, effective damage. I think the problem with the Houthis is that they have dispersed a great many um, drones and missiles and cruise missiles all the way across uh, Yemen, which uh, once the Biden administration uh, reclassified them from being a terrorist organization to just, well, your run-of-the-mill uh, insurgents um, came flooding into the region by the Iranians by several routes, mostly by uh, sea and air. So, as I've tried to explain in various um, publications, there is really only one way we can decisively um, affect the Houthis and their, I will say this, their genocidal attitude towards us as Jews and as Israelis. When they have some of these very large um, demonstrations in, the ca in their capital, Sana'a, they can, they can sometimes have upwards of half a million um, armed uh, participants there. All armed Both. with AK-47s and with their traditional, uh, as peace-loving uh, Islamo-Nazis, their traditional uh, daggers worn on their, on their stomachs. Right, in, in their, uh, right. Um, and, and actually a fair number of old Lee Enfields uh, which I've noticed, which is kind of nice. But at any rate, they have these massive demonstrations. The, there are no women there. There are very rarely any children. These are fighting men, both in uniform and in uh, tribal outfits. 
that's when I asked a friend of mine in the military, what do you call this? And I showed him a video of a demonstration held several weeks ago with nearly half a million of these uh, these crazies screaming for our blood with the uh, president of uh, the Houthis there and uh, representatives of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and members of the Iranian embassy, et cetera, et cetera. He said, it's a demonstration. I said, no, uh, General, it is not a demonstration. This is a target. And he said, we don't have a, a weapon that we can, we can use against this demonstration that would make any difference. Even if we flew 20 or 30 aircraft uh, to drop bombs on them, it still wouldn't really affect the kind of uh, uh, change you want in the government. I said, I'm not talking about conventional munitions. I'm talking about either a neutron or a small weapon. And he blanched. And he said, uh, you can't be serious. This was I an, said, an, Israeli, an Israeli general or an American general? Israeli. I don't talk to Americans. <laughs> they won't talk to me. Uh, uh, I, want, I wonder why. Yeah, I wonder why. Um, no, I said, we are in an existential war right now. A multi-front existential war. And in this kind of situation, the the key to winning this war, apart from cutting the head of the octopus off, which we'll talk about in just a bit, our objective, immediate objective, is to eliminate as many fronts as possible. Paradoxically, the easiest front for us to take care of uh, to eliminate is Yemen, uh, the Houthis, rather. Um, they are basically a one bomb enemy by that i mean if we were to actually uh pull off um against one of these demonstrations um we would very seriously undermine their capabilities of uh continuing their long-range rocket and drone attacks against israel and their attacks against merchant shipping in the red sea and their obvious attempt to choke off our southern access to Asia. This is for economic reasons. Uh, there are targets that we have not hit yet that we should. And that, and that should have been done on, on the first day we struck Yemen or the Houthis. Um, that includes the presidential palace, their ministry of defense, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard headquarters, and the Iranian embassy. These are all valid targets. We are at war with the Houthis. And, you know, I haven't heard this actually expressed this way by anybody in the Israeli government. When you say you're at war, what does that mean? It means that any weapon that you deem appropriate to the threat that you're facing is on the table. There have been many people, I might, I admit, and I, and I might uh, address right now, who have been very um, scared about my reference to nuclear weapons. Well, I'm sorry, but um, I hate to break it to these people, but uh, we have a right and a duty to use these weapons since they are no longer deterring our enemies from waging an existential, genocidal, zero-sum war against us. We are, people may not realize this, but we are fighting for our lives right now in a way that we haven't seen since 1948. And I don't think anybody has the right, let alone the Israeli military, anybody has the right to tell us what we can and cannot use to defend ourselves. So in this case, um, there are some valid targets we could hit that would that remain to be hit that would be sure to bring out uh, one of these massive demonstrations. And that's when we hit them. One bomb. I wanted to ask you, Jonathan, what about 
the use of cluster bombs? Even with uh, cl airdropped cluster bombs, um, the number of aircraft that we would actually have to use uh, would be beyond, I believe, would be beyond our ability to, um, to, to actually operate because of tanker uh, limitations, aerial tanker limitations. Um, I might add, parenthetically, there was an opportunity to... Um, build our own tankers by converting uh, uh, commercial aircraft. But again, uh, it was easier to just uh, take, take the drug, so to speak, American uh, military aid. And we're still waiting for the uh, tankers from the new tankers from the United States that have been promised us that don't work. Interestingly enough, there was a video that came out of our tanker operations. And uh, what was seen, and this is kind of interesting because a lot of people called me um, and, and to have discussions with me about this. The main problem with the new American tanker is this remote vision uh, refueling system that they have where in the old tankers, you'd actually have a guy in the back of the tanker kind of manually inserting the probe, the, um, the fuel probe into the aircraft that they're refueling, the fighter underneath them, for example. Well, in the new plane, it's done remotely. And a guy is sitting forward, looking at a, at a TV screen, doing this. The Americans haven't apparently gotten this right yet. We have. And it was very interesting. This is why people were calling me, saying, why don't the Americans call us and ask them how we actually did it? And um, on the other hand, they were criticizing us um, for still using uh, analog dials and switches in the airplane. And I said, don't criticize us for that. And they said, well, why not? Why don't you use uh, more sophisticated electronics? And I said, because if there's a nuclear blast anywhere, those analog uh, dials and switches will continue to work while your you know, integrated circuits and your highfalutin electronics, touch screens and everything else are gonna go blank. Um, the Russians, for example, uh, the Russian Air Force still uses a lot of uh, analog equipment in their aircraft for just this reason. When uh, Soviet MiG-25 pilot defected uh, to the United States and Japan landed in Hokkaido in northern Japan. Everybody that I knew at the time, I was in intelligence at the time, was uh, laughing about the old fashioned electronics in this aircraft. And we were told straight away, don't you dare laugh at this. That plane will continue to fly because of that equipment, as opposed to our stuff that's going to just crash and burn. So it was interesting. That was the one interesting thing from this latest strike that came out. Um, as far as the use of nuclear weapons versus cluster bombs and the like, look, if we had bombers uh, like the B-1 bomber or even the B-2 stealth bomber or the B-52, heavy bombers, yes, we could do it. We could, um, we could hit that... Um, demonstration, if you will, um, and wipe it out. No question about it. But we don't have those capabilities. And, and what I would rather, uh, what I would prefer is to make a demonstration that um, your weapons, at least as we're concerned, are on the table. This will have a chilling effect on everybody in the region. If we don't, let's say half these uh, screaming genocidal maniacs in uh, the Houthis in one strike with a, uh, a missile launched either from an airplane uh, or a ballistic missile fired from Israel, um, the what we call the shock and awe 
of the action will literally destabilize the other front because they won't know whether we're willing to use such weapons again. Again, if we had a conventional capability, I'm, I'm still not convinced a conventional capability to affect the same end. I'm not exactly convinced that it would have the same impact as our um, releasing the genie, so to speak, as it's called, uh, of nuclear weaponry. Um, as I said, this is a war for our survival right now. And the only way we can close down a front in this war is in the most dramatic, decisive way possible. And I'm, I just, I, I hate to keep drilling this into people, but um, such a weapon, if used against this type of target, will take that front, that Houthi front, off the map. Um, does it represent? You would, you would think. You would think that the world would would and certainly should thank us. Uh, believe it or not, because um, they, they, these these Houthis are uh, taking on the entire world by Correct. by threatening uh, international shipping, as they just the other day did. They they uh, struck a, a British oil tanker with a drone. Correct. You're 100 percent correct. And yes, there'll be a great thumping of chests and a, a gnashing of teeth and a tearing of hair over the fact that, you know, the, the nuclear genie is out of the bottle. But quietly, all of the maritime nations will be thanking us for finally doing what should have been done um, quite some time ago. Look, the U.S. Navy, um, they're since the Second World War has had one principal mission, and that's to secure the freedom of the seas. And they just haven't done it in this case for very apparent, uh, well, for very obvious reasons. Um, the o o Biden administration um, can't bring itself to acknowledge that they made a mistake on the Houthis and God forbid, uh, if they actually did start hammering the Houthis with bombers, B-52s, B-1s, B-2s, and really gave them a shock, a conventional shock and awe uh, that, well, some Iranians might get hurt. That's the, that's the excuse they've been using. They just don't want to run the risk of hurting some Iranians. The Europeans that have their own uh, armada, if you can call it that, their naval group down there, are only engaged in defensive actions uh, to protect uh, merchant shipping. They haven't, they've made it very clear they don't want to strike anything on land. And the one country that is suffering the most from the Houthis' assault on maritime traffic in the Red Sea, Egypt has been adamantly opposed to any involvement in this matter whatsoever, even though they have ships, uh, naval assets that could be very helpful down there right now. Uh, they don't want any part of this at all. So they're, they're prepared to let the Europeans and Uncle Sam more or less uh, take care of the Houthis. Um, even, even if it is clear that they are not? Even if it's clear that they are not, they the, they the Egyptians, the, as you, as you say, the Egyptians are suffering. They are, they are hurting. Their tolls, the um, the amount of money they get from the Suez Canal each year in tolls amounts to about nine billion dollars, which is a a great chunk of their foreign exchange that they um, receive each year. So the question is, why aren't the Egyptians involved in this at all? I mean, I can understand why the Saudis aren't. Um, they got bruised pretty badly in, the, in their war against the Houthis, mostly by mismanagement, just absolute stupidity uh, by their military. But the Egyptians, the Egyptians are very afraid that the Houthis will make good on their threat to 
literally closed down the Suez Canal by either targeting ships in the canal with long range missiles or drones, or actually send a ship through the canal laden with explosives and sink the ship right smack in the middle of the canal. Maybe not just one, but several. So the Egyptians are, are very afraid that the Houthis have the capability of shutting the canal down for, well, probably years. For years, probably for years, yes. Yes, years, if they so desire. So despite all of the American military largesse that's been showered on Egypt in the, uh, due to the uh, foolishly agreed to Camp David agreement, um, they're not willing to risk the canal at all whatsoever. So this is something that hasn't been stated um, as such. But it's something that I've been able to read between the lines uh, in terms of uh, Egyptians' professional statement, professional military statements that have come out, and I've read in translation. So the Houthis, it's our problem because the Americans aren't going to solve it. The Europeans certainly won't. The Egyptians won't. Nobody will. But we are in a position to do so. And again, people should understand the threat to us is not just from these uh, periodic long range drone and um, uh, ballistic missile strikes against us. It's from the Houthis commitment to closing down our access to Asian markets. That's, you know, they can talk all they want about uh, their solidarity with the uh, Hamas Nikim in Gaza. They can talk all they want about that, but if you actually read what they've been saying, and I do in, uh, in translation, they're making a big deal out of the fact that they're, quote, going to strangle us uh, in terms of our access to uh, the Asian market. And um, we doubt that at our own peril because they're doing it right now. I don't know how many ships have visited a lot. I, I don't think any of them have merchant ships. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but um, not I, I could be off by that, but not by much. So this is an this also is an existential threat. It's an economic one, but it uh, it is nevertheless an existential economic threat to us. So, as I said, um, we have the ability to stop this and to take that front, that Houthi front off the board, which is something Within a multi-front war, we should uh, be very predisposed to do. But again, the incrementalists in the Kyria are in charge of things, and uh, they just don't get it. They don't get it at all. all. Again, in conclusion, all those targets that were just recently hit should have been hit on the first strike we made. And there were a few others that we could have made on that first strike, shutting down Sana'a International Airport and hitting uh, the Houthi Presidential Palace, the Ministry of Defense, the Iranian Embassy, and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps headquarters. All of these targets could have been hit on day one. But again, as I said, it's the incrementalists that have the day in the Kyria. Which brings, brings us to the next point, Moving to the north, in the, uh, the inheritance of the tribe of Asher, also known mm. by some as southern Lebanon, for some, <laughs> for some reason. And Naftali was up there also, wasn't it? Well, to the to the east, yes. Uh, you have yeah. Asher on the, further to the west along the coast and somewhat inland, Zavulun and Naftali further to the to the east. But for now, let's concentrate on the tribe of, of Asher. All, all this is part of the Holy Land promised by Hashem, the creator to the Jewish people. And this this is our land that we're fighting. It's not it's not foreign territory. That's that's the point right. I'm making. What what do you make of the of the the way the, the war is being prosecuted there with the recent uh, one week ago exactly the the ground operation 
in in uh, the territory of Asher was was commenced. We were told for about a year and a, almost two years before October seventh that in the event of a war up north, there would be a there would be massive damage done to our home front until the ground offensive uh, had completed its mission in southern Lebanon. And I was always kind of concerned about that because it sounded like the army was committed to a very slow slog, if you will, through southern Lebanon. And unfortunately, they are. Now, the Air Force has done a lot and they're there to be commended uh, to softening up this uh, northern front, both by targeted killings, um, assassinations, if you will, of uh, the Hezbollah leadership. And we might add that the latest uh, replacement for Nasrallah um, seems to be buried under several hundred tons of concrete and steel right now. So I think it's safe to say he's written off. Uh, he, he didn't. We, he didn't apparently even get to change the nameplate on on the door of his office. <laughs> no, no. So, um, and the Air Force has been very good, also at uh, selectively removing other um, combatants um, in in Lebanon, Hezbollah combatants, and uh, other Palestinian faction leaders. They've been and, very good and, at and revolutionary uh, Iranian revolutionary guard uh, commanders, uh, including a general, I think, recently. He was the second in command of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and more recently, they may have killed. We may have killed um, the head of the Quds Force, which is their kind of elite commando force within the Revolutionary Guards. They still can't find his body right now, and uh, somebody put out a rumor which has gone viral in Iran, that he <laughs> defected or was kidnapped by us uh, because they can't find his body anywhere. So that that's kind of funny. Um, and of, of course, um, you know, apart from all of that, the Air Force has been very effective at hitting arms dumps. And you can see from all the videos that are released, these secondary explosions that are just monumental um, that have in, in, occurred. Including, in one might add, including beneath uh, the uh, Total company, the French uh, oil company Total or Total in Beirut, they have a, a petrol station which was taken out the other day and there were massive secondary explosions from beneath this station, which uh, station. which makes you wonder, <laughs> were they were they were they unaware that uh, no his had placed all the, no. all those armaments beneath them? No, um, they weren't, uh, and and any more than the UNRWA was um, unaware of uh, Hamas's uh, you know recruitment of their teachers and the location of. Um, uh, arms dumps in all of their schools. The problem, though, up north has to do with the ground uh, operation. We spent some time clearing, attempting to clear the proximate border with commando operations, very quiet commando operations, which were fine. I mean, that's kind of preparing the ground. That's okay. Um, there was one thing I saw that was very distressing to me. There was a tunnel found uh, leading up from uh, a Lebanese village, southern Lebanon village, to a, an Israeli kibbutz that we, the army decided to uh, mobilize scores of concrete trucks uh, to fill in. And I found this very distressing because if this land, which the enemy has used to threaten us, is is not is going to be turned back to the enemy, then I understand why they were using concrete. But there was no re there is no reason to consider turning any of this land back. 
Lebanon, as we've all dis- as you and I have discussed before, doesn't really exist anymore. It's just a battlefield at at best, and at worst, it's just a uh, it's been hijacked by Iran, care of their Hezbollah proxies. It's a it's so a, stage, it's a we, staging ground. It's a staging, a staging ground for ground. the revolutionary guards. Correct. So why are we wasting all this these resources and money on filling these tunnels in with concrete if we're not ready to actually turn the land back, which we are. So I found that very distressing. Second of all, in this kind of operation, it calls for a blitzkrieg. And we have a very good starting point at uh, Metula. We can reach the Latani River very quickly from Metula and head west to to actually separate uh, southern Lebanon from uh, the north. And using that same route, we can go straight north to the Awali River and the Becca. So we're in a very good position if we employ a blitzkrieg to actually ac- accomplish our territorial objectives in the south. Most of the rockets, by the way, that are hitting us right now are being launched from southern Lebanon. This is areas south of the Latani River. Well, why are we going so slowly? We've prepared the ground with air, with our aerial campaign. We've cleared the initial border with our commando operations. So unleash the army in a in what I call a blitzkrieg. Uh, when you people have said to me, well, you know, Jonathan, there are lots of villages. They're not villages. They're targets. You know. You know, the Russians have a wonderful weapon. It's called a thermobaric bomb. They have multiple rocket launchers that have them. Hammer them with, you know, regular explosive uh, multiple rocket launchers, which we have and we export. They're wonderful weapons that we produce. And then finish it up with uh, the thermobaric bombs, which burn and asphyxiate everything and move on. You don't have to go house to house. You, you blow the pieces and then you burn it. And anybody hiding down below or whatever will be asphyxiated by the thermobaric bombs that are being, or vacuum bombs as they're called, which are being used. You do not fight a war in low gear. You just don't. You have to seize the initiative and keep the initiative for as long as, until you reach your, uh, accomplish your stop lines. You reach your stop lines. And frankly, I don't know what the stop lines are right now because the army has been sending out mixed messages and i have a real fear that they don't even know what the stop line is some of them say eight to ten kilometers in some say up to the latani some say some have said up to the awali river i've heard that because they've told uh warned people that they shouldn't just stop uh across the latani they should continue beyond the awali river to the north, they're coming out of north, and this is not by calculation. This is not uh, to deceive the enemy. There, I think, there's real confusion right now in the Kyria as to what our stop lines actually are, and this is very troubling. And I do not consider the ground operation right now, apart from the initial commando raid raids that took place, uh, have taken place to be successful. Somebody needs to light a fire under somebody's posterior and to tell them to get going. And I I don't know when and if that's going to happen. Uh, They talked from the start about a, quote, limited campaign. You don't talk about a limited campaign. I mean, if it's meant to deceive people, fine. But it wasn't. Why they mentioned a limited campaign was in deference to the Americans that that warned us nothing more than a limited campaign. I and I, I didn't know what that meant. You know, if you cro- you clear the border, you know, they kept talking five to eight kilometers. Well, the Cornet anti tank missile has a ten kilometer range. So, are you going to go to ten kilometers? Well, the Americans say, well, well, wait a second, that's not a limited war. You're encroaching on the territorial integrity of Lebanon at that point. So. As far as the ground campaign is concerned in Lebanon, I'm absolutely, 
I think the word is disgusted with what's occurred right now. I mean, a junior officer would know that when you cross a border now, after it's been cleared a little bit by commando raids, you have to unleash the army. Concentration, uh, overwhelming firepower, and speed. The, this, these are the elements of Blitzkrieg. And I don't know, maybe we've forgotten how to do that. But it's essential. And again, we can accomplish all of these things right from Metula. We don't have to cross the border linearly. We can, we can pick the places where we're going to cross for concentrated uh, forces and firepower, uh, hopefully armored formations that will strike for the uh, Latani and then at the same time, the Awali River, and then just move south and just kill everything. We've had a, done a very good job, actually, of um, for, forcing the evacuation of most of the, of the uh, residents in the south, um, pretty far to the north. So the idea of causing civilian casualties, which I couldn't care less about in this area, um, shouldn't be on the table as a concern. Uh, as far as um, Sidon and uh, Tyre are concerned, um, again, these are cities that uh, I feel will, should be part of uh, the region annexed by us. Um, there has to be a warning to these people, get somewhere, because if you don't, uh, your cities are going to be out. They're going to be totally pushed. And again, this is where uh, the issue of nuclear weapons come in. In this case, limited uh, or tactical nuclear weapons come in. We need to clear these two cities, Sidon and Tyre, if we're going to have an effective drive to the Latani, let alone to the Awali River. Um, all's fair in war. And, uh, you know, they're still hitting us. They will continue to hit us as long as they have breath and a rocket to fire. So why should our cities right now be threatened even by one missile from a region that the army should be crawling all over right now? I don't know. It's a good question to ask uh, General um, Hetsi Halevi, the uh, chief of staff. I have no idea. It's uh, a poor performance as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh. To be honest, I'm not sure that he himself knows the answer to your, to your questions. Uh, but, he may uh, not. He may not. Uh, th this is why... I, I sense that he he is... He, he himself, I think, might be recalculating his his trajectory and the, 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 his future actions. He's he, he, honestly... he seems to be He seems to be willing to more willing now to go along with Netanyahu's demands than a year ago. That's my impression. Um, in certain areas, like this strike on Nasrallah, okay, um, I don't think that was a hard decision to make. And with Netanyahu at the UN, um, you know, I've heard it referred to as that godfather scene you know, where during the baptism, uh, you know, all the uh, enemies of the uh, Corleone family were getting knocked off one after the other. That was a, it was a good operation. There's no question. The pager operation was excellent. Uh, no question about that. But when it comes to conventional war, we're just, I don't know what the story is with this. Uh, this is, again, the result of uh, Ehud Barak. Barach, as I call him, and his uh, decision to shift from conventional war to a more glamorous high-tech war uh, uh, founded on air power, intelligence, and commando raids. Well, that isn't going to work in southern Lebanon. Conventional war doctrine has to be used there now. Now, um, I, I don't think there's any question that... Uh... Part of of the answer to your questions and your and the uh, the your the the uh, points that you're making comes down to the American involvement and and pressure regarding our 
our military activities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, territory of Asher in southern Lebanon, Iran, and, and Gaza, every, everywhere. The Americans are, everywhere. Busy, are busy trying to to uh, keep things on a very, yeah, very low, does. very, very low flame. Correct. When in Look, fact, we should be doing the opposite. Right now, the American objective in Lebanon, from what I've read, is to get the Lebanese to elect a new president or a new prime minister who will um, somehow fight for the independence of Lebanon. This is a fool's errand. And I, I simply, you know, uh, view this luck. as... Just, good luck with that. Yeah, good luck with that. They, you know, the, Hezbollah has a very remarkable track record of getting rid of people like that. And I think um, if there were such an, a fool, a suicidal fool to take that role, uh, his life would be measured in uh, minutes, uh, if not seconds. Amos Hochstein, an evil, evil, self-hating Jew, um, has actually been representing Hezbollah in his uh, diplomatic activities, plain and simple. Whether it was the American effort to slow down our offensive in Gaza and tie our hands with regard to the type of tactics that we used and to burden us with uh, you know, the humanitarian relief that only ended up supplying our uh, Hamas, um, all these ancillary things that, that just completely uh, slowed our, our operation and increased our casualties down culminated in their basically their demand for us to halt outside of Rafa and gave Hamas time to prepare a very warm welcome for us when we finally got around to going into that city and winkling Hamas out. Um, and in Lebanon, they have done exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing. Uh, they've attempted to prevent us from escalating the conflict, as they call it. Um, and when we respond by saying, hey, we have close to 80,000 internally displaced people from the north, their homes, their businesses, their, their, their agricultural lands have been destroyed. And it's, you know, tit for tat with the uh, with Hezbollah. And they they've shown absolutely no a hint of restraining themselves, the Americans just tell us, you know, you're the pro we're the problem by escalating the situation in Lebanon, by taking out uh, Hezbollah leaders and commanders, uh, attacking the Hezbollah uh, supply system, their arms dumps and the like. We haven't gotten any support from the United States, either diplomatically or materially uh, with regard to Lebanon. They, despite, if anything, despite the protestations of uh, Joe O'Biden that no one has helped Israel more than, than I, he says. But of course, this is, this is wow. disingenuous. Yeah. It, it's disingenuous and it's, uh, it's beyond that. It's, a lie. It's, a, it's just an outright blatant lie. Uh, they still haven't provided us with um 2000 pound bombs they're still restricting that um and other supplies as well so as far as the bottom line with lebanon is concerned uh we have an ability to close that front down but we have to get a move on and we're not because I do not believe that the general staff uh, has decided where the stop line is because they're afraid of the American reaction. That's, that's my reading of the situation. Um, if we were an independent country, we would, we would have unleashed armored and mechanized forces already out of the, the panhandle of Israel uh, by uh, Metula and Kiryat Shmona uh, to overrun southern Lebanon and then up to the up to the Awali and and into the Becca. But uh, we're not doing this. It's going to be a slow grind. And if we're doing house to house, 
in these villages were fighting Hezbollah's war. You do not fight house to house. I've opposed this uh, from the minute I put a uniform on. You do not fight house to house. You destroy the house. You destroy the village. You destroy the city. And if necessary, then um, go around. Don't don't engage in urban conflict. I said this within Gaza, where I for four years before the war, I kept describing urban combat as Stalingrad on the Med. And I said, we don't have the soldiers to wage this kind of insane battle. Well, I guess we did when the Americans got involved and said, you know, don't bomb these uh, buildings anymore. Send your troops in to see who and what is in there. And that's when our casualties started skyrocketing. And in Lebanon, I just have this terrible feeling that uh, we're going to go slowly, slowly uh, keeping a, what we call a weather eye on the Americans. And when the Americans say stop, no matter where we are and how far we've gotten in our offensive, uh, the generals will start quaking in their boots and uh, Netanyahu is going to have a real problem on his hands at that point. Do you, do you think, Jonathan, that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is perhaps waiting for Trump? Um, could be. But I think um, if he is, um, it's a foolish decision. Why do I say this? There is an equal possibility that, or more, God forbid, that Kamala Harris may be the next president. Mm -hmm. And I say, uh, God forbid. You have to take that into account. You have to forget about Trump winning. You have to worry about worst case. And the worst case is if Kamala Harris wins. If that is your marker, so to speak, then you want to get as much done as possible before she's, God, I hate to say this, elected uh, to the presidency. You can't count on something happening that you have no control over. Uh, Trump winning. And with Trump, I, I got to warn people. It's a mixed bag. You do not know, no one knows exactly what he might do from one day to the next. He could wake up and simply say, you've, you've, you've done enough damage in Lebanon, uh, cool it. Because, you know, uh, Jared and Ivanka want to build a, a resort, you know, in, uh, in Beirut, like they're doing in Albania right now, which is okay, actually. The Albanians are good people. Um, so... I've all, I have been trained um, always in every case to do worst case analysis and build my doctrine around that. So in this case, simply put, the worst case is the election of Kamala Harris. Okay, that means you have to get as much done as possible before she enters office. And we're not doing that. Uh, we're not doing that in, in Gaza right now, even though I think Bibi has finally seen the, the big picture there and has accepted the advice of his uh, tactical officers uh, to evacuate the civilians from northern Gaza, to stop all humanitarian aid to that region, and to pound the area into rubble. Okay, this should have been done on October 8th. And these same generals have advised this uh, process to be used in central uh, Gaza with Khan Yunus and in Rafa eventually. Well, that's fine. But the issue has to do with what do you do with the day after with the people who are still there, the Fakistinians that are still there. And until and unless Bibi Netanyahu says at some point, they are going to be somewhere, not our problem. They're on the beach, corralled. Somebody better take them off because they're not going to get any food or any other supplies. Until we have Faza, so that the tallest building is an anthill, 
until we have killed Yaha Sinwar and every other Hamas uh, fighter we can find, unless they bring in a live hostage. Then they can go to a prison of my making that will be a living hell, but they'll be alive. But that's the only way we should allow any of them to live. And, you know, lastly, I'm going to probably just elicit a lot of anger from this, from the listeners on this. We annex uh, Gaza and we repopulate it with Jews. I would, like, I would like to hope, Jonathan, that at least many of our viewers will not be in the least angry with you. Quite the opposite. This is, this, is what so we, this is what we both have been advocating for, well, actually before uh, before this before began, the but, but certainly since the war began, and we began these podcasts, uh, we have said, and we in fact, uh, uh, we, we showed here on screen a few times the, the sticker that was printed up to this effect. The message is, turn towards Hashem and act in accordance with His will, fight the enemy, destroy them, drive them out, and resettle our land with the Jews. That's, Correct. That is the only the, the only possible formula for victory. For victory. By the way, there was a recent uh, scientific poll that was uh, conducted in Gaza. And, um, you know, I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is another left-wing poll showing that we've committed genocide. But it wasn't. It was an extremely accurate poll that was done. And the one pie chart that uh, stood out from... I'm sorry, I, mi I, I missed what you said. This poll was done, undertaken by whom? It was a uh, Palestinian group that did it, but it was done scientifically. Um, it was I'm sorry to correct you. Fakistinian, yes. Fakistinian, yeah. But the one pie chart that they had that was the most significant... And it should have been a top story in Israel, except for the, um, well, the, the how, do, how do I say this politely? The uh, censorship, self-censorship of the liberal uh, Israeli media establishment. The pie chart indicated that almost half of the, of the fake Assyrians who happen to reside in Gaza want out immediately they want to go somewhere else they don't want to come back they want to just get somewhere that isn't a, a battlefield almost half and I'm, this I'm, is very I'm willing to help them out i'm with a, definitely with a, with a one way them. ticket exactly that's they're they're good with that they they indicated that they they don't want to come back under any circumstances i'm sure that trudeau macron um, perhaps uh, Starmer, if he if he manages to pull himself away from his friend Lord Ali um, for a few moments to consider the matter, um, he uh, they would they would be happy to receive these wonderful peace loving um, people as, as citizens of their country. Surely they would contribute. Uh, Ireland, no doubt, Ireland would society. definitely uh, benefit from a couple hundred thousand fake Assyrians. I think that's the best thing I could wish on Ireland in particular. As the expression goes, they deserve each other. Perfectly. <laughs> Indeed. 